On today's episode, we'll be talking about prophetic dreams, spirits, glowing orbs, and much more. All coming up on this edition of Paranormal Mysteries. Welcome to the show, and thank you for joining me. I am your host, Nick Ryan. Before we start, I'd like to say thank you to Deborah. Your support and generosity are greatly appreciated. If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe, share, and review the podcast. And if you'd like to support us even further by becoming a patron or by donating, please visit us at patreon.com slash paranormalmysteries or at buymeacoffee.com slash paranormal. Please remember that your support in any form helps to make the show possible. And if you've encountered the paranormal and would like to share your story, please email me at paranormalmysteriespodcast at gmail.com. All experiences, no matter how big or small, are always welcome. And with that in mind, our first listener story comes to us from Ruth. Ruth's story is called, A Visit from My Mother. Ruth says, Hello, Nick. I've been a fan for a while of yours and binge-listened for a while before thinking of sharing my story. It's not a dark story, but a bittersweet one. I don't know how appropriate this is, but maybe it's time that I started sharing it. It has been 25 years since my mother's death. I encountered a ghostly presence. It was my mother. You see, I couldn't get her on the phone on February 14th, 1995, to wish her Happy Valentine's Day, and I became really worried. It was winter in Wisconsin. There was a terrible snowstorm that night, and I couldn't get out till the next morning. The next day, I drove as quickly as I could to my mom's house, where I found her there, seated on a bench, covered in snow. I went into deep shock, and there is nothing like the primal scream of grief when you lose someone so very close. I had a fitful night of sleep the next night, but I finally found myself in an intensely lucid dream, standing in line to go into a restaurant with my mother at my side. We used to love going out together and trying new restaurants. When I saw her, I told her, Mom, you look so good. You finally got that haircut that you liked. She struggled for many years getting just the right haircut and she was wearing this cool trench coat that shimmered, kind of bluish and greenish iridescent colors. She looked much younger, maybe 40-ish, and she was 80 at the time of her death. We finally made our way to a booth in this nondescript Applebee's-like restaurant and sat down. And this is what she said to me. I want you to know that I love you, and that I can't tell you where I am right now. You wouldn't understand. Just know that I am happy. What you're about to go through is going to be very, very hard. You're going to have to be strong. After that dream faded, or I can't remember any more, I'm not sure which, she was right. It was very difficult for a good two years afterwards. Families can make it very hard. What punctuated this dream happened two days after her death. I received a Valentine card from my mom in the mail. She filled it with little balloons, and she wrote... My darling daughter, time and circumstances may change, but always know that I love you. And that is constant. Happy Valentine's Day. Love, Mom. I'm really so grateful that she said goodbye. It did help with the ease of her passing, eventually, and also to know that this place is not the end. I'll see her again someday, but I have a few years left and many things to do yet here. It doesn't quite end here, though. There was one big odd thing that happened afterwards, which kind of defies everyday reality and took years to reveal itself. I didn't dream much for two years after my mom died, but I did remember a couple of dreams. The main one occurred during the cleanup of my mom's house, as all the kids and their spouses helped to ready it for sale. My mom's house was on a river, the St. Croix River, in a very rural setting between Minnesota and Wisconsin. It was a house that my dad and mom had built long before I was born. Dad died before I was three, so I didn't really remember much of him. And I have four older brothers who are significantly older than me. This bit of info is important in the telling of this story. 
in that the house faced towards the river, and in between the house and the river were four very old oak trees, easily 250 years old or more. They grew so big and so close to one another that you couldn't tell when one tree started or ended. The family always remarked that those old oak trees were the four boys, and for over 30 years, that's all I ever heard. As a little kid, the youngest and only girl, I thought to myself, what am I, chopped liver? But in the backyard, away from all the other boys' trees, was another oak tree. Not as old, maybe a hundred years or so, but it was fully rounded and growing strongly on its own. Well, I thought, if the guys have their own tree, then so can I. And that tree in the backyard was me. Remember, this dream occurred not too long after my mom passed, perhaps due to heightened sensitivity. In the dream, I decided to hug my tree to say goodbye, and noticed a limb had been cut off about seven feet off the ground. It was an old cut, and the bark started to grow over the wound, leaving a ten-inch circle. I then decided, while still in the dream, to cut in my year of birth, which I did. Shrugging, I decided to put in my year of death, and the year 2012 came to me. This was back in 1995, well before the 2012 stories of the Mayan end count, or the Hopi prophecy. I knew nothing about them, but through those intervening years, family and friends, upon hearing of my eventual demise, used to give me rations of crap. I eventually came to the conclusion that it wasn't so much of an actual physical death, but an end of a life known to an unknown life to come, a death of an old way of living or thinking. At least, that is what I started to believe. In an interesting aside, in so-called waking reality, I didn't recall whether or not the tree had a missing limb. I went out to the backyard, and yes, it was there. How odd. Around 2010, I really wasn't thinking about 2012 and the impending death that was to come. I decided early on not to worry about it and to just live. 2012 came. And exactly on June 21st, on the summer solstice, the exact middle of the year, I was rushing into the local library for movie night. The glass sliding door parted, and I managed to trip on the threshold. Falling forward, my shoulder purse strap caught on the moving door's handle, ripping my shoulder apart. It and my shoulder went right, and the rest of me went to the left. I broke the head of my humerus with three out of four possible breaks. It took a six-hour surgery and three years of recovery to get the use of my right arm back. Now, not every perceived tragedy is a bad thing. I'll explain. I spent the previous 15 years doing computer graphic design and literally selling my soul to government and corporate entities. I hated the work. I quit my job in 2011. Scary enough, but I wanted to be an artist on my own. No more working for others. And in early 2012, and losing money fast... Sadly, I started to look for graphic design work again. But June 21st, 2012, changed my life permanently. It was almost like the universe screamed at me, No, no, no! You're not supposed to be doing that. You're supposed to be doing this. Now, no going back. After gaining the use of my shoulder again, I couldn't really do computer work anymore. Long hours and hard repetitions. After recovery, I went to vocational rehab, They helped with retraining to do the silver design work, sending me to school, and now I have a studio in my home. As I said, not every tragedy or hardship is a bad one. I don't make a lot of money, but I get to work on what I want, and I don't have a problem calling myself a real artist anymore. My muse is nature, and the little voices from source as I've come to know them. They seem to guide me in my making. Life is good, and now we just all have to be smart safe and kind, and survive a world pandemic. Easy peasy. Thank you for reading, Nick. And as I said, I don't share this with everybody, but when I caught your discussion on your podcast, it seemed like a good way of sharing. At least the story and what happened is important to me. Yours, Ruth. Our next listener story comes to us from Ash. Ash says, I really do enjoy listening to your podcast. I have a few short stories, and I will put them below, all involving one of my best friends, while we were in high school. As mentioned, where I grew up was a strange place. An old Native American burial ground is what I was told. My friend, let's call her BQ, 
was witness to a few things that happened here. We were in my bedroom talking, and all of a sudden BQ says, Do you see that? I look to where her eyes are, and in my TV, it was one of those TV-VCR combos from the 90s, there was a man's face with sunglasses, and he whispered, Oh yeah, then slowly faded away. The TV was off, and it had been off the whole time, and no one else was home. When he appeared or faded, it was like when you turn off an old TV, and there was that rainbow halo effect. We never saw or heard that again, but it was crazy. I was taking her home one night, and it was really late. As I turned out of the trailer park, we saw what appeared to be an elderly woman hunched over with long gray braids, an animal pelt draped around her shoulders, and a long walking stick. She was just walking along the side of the road, and there were no Native Americans left living in that area. BQ screamed, and I looked in my rearview mirror, and the woman walking just faded away. One New Year's night, I was taking BQ home. It was a rainy night, and my headlights land on this extremely tall figure. She was walking on the side of the road, with her head down, hair soaked, and draped over her face. You could see an oddly large, toothy smile from underneath her hair, and it went from ear to ear. As she walked, she was jerking and kind of shaking, and she appeared to be laughing. It reminded me of something out of an anime. BQ screamed at me to go. She was terrified. I was so scared to go home after I dropped her off. I thought for sure this demon lady was going to be on my porch waiting for me, but we never saw her again. This all happened in 2003 or 2004. I recently spoke to BQ, and she brought up the last story and how it stuck with her and still freaks her out. I do have more stories that I will send your way. Our next story comes to us from Jenny. Jenny's story is called Glowing Orbs. Jenny says, I have been listening to several podcasts that share paranormal stories, but I have not felt comfortable sharing with any of them. But I guess I can share here, because some of the listeners' stories you have shared give me hope that I won't be viewed as crazy. I remember seeing things from a very young age. I was brought up in a very Christian home and not allowed to view any type of scary movies. I woke up several times, seeing lights in other rooms from my room at night. I am pretty sure what I was seeing was orbs, but I didn't know what they were at the time. The orbs scared me, but I never mentioned them to anyone. One night I saw an orb in my parents' room, but it was acting different. This orb was bouncing up and down, like it wanted to catch my attention. I watched it bounce for a little bit, and then I noticed little dots of light coming from it. The dots started to cover my floor, and I got really scared of them. The dots were writhing around on my floor, and I needed to use the restroom, but I wouldn't put my foot down with the dots. I started screaming and woke my parents up. My parents then rushed into my room and turned on my light. We then saw that the entire floor was covered in fire ants. They started biting my dad as soon as he got near me. He grabbed me off my bed and handed me to my mother, who then took me into the bathroom. He sprayed the floor of my room with bug killer, and I slept on the couch that night. The weird thing about this event was my parents never figured out where the ants had come from. They were only in my room, and they couldn't find a hole or entry point for them, and I am very allergic to fire ants. They always leave a big welt and get infected. I grew up in Texas, and avoiding fire ants isn't easy. It felt like this orb was a warning to me, trying to protect me from a danger that I couldn't see in the dark. I wanted to thank you for your show and the work you do. You make people feel comfortable telling their stories, and that is priceless. I have many stories of things I have experienced over my childhood and also adult years. I am an empath with a few other gifts, so at times it feels like weird things and people are attracted to me. I am willing to share some of them, so others will know that they are not alone. Love and light to everyone in this trying time. Be safe. Jen. Our next story comes to us from Lisa. Lisa's story is called My Experiences. Lisa says, Hello, Nick. I hope this finds you and yours healthy and doing well during these challenging times. I have been listening to your podcast while working the last few weeks. I find the stories very intriguing, and many of them resonate strongly with me. 
so I wanted to share a few of my own. Before I begin, I would like to disclose that I am a Hayoki empath, clairsentient, and although admittedly I try to ignore it, mildly clairaudient. I have a ton of stories, but will only write the few right now that center around the same house, and I have changed the names. This all happened around 2004 or 2005, when I had just started dating my second husband, Jake. At the time, he rented a room from a co-worker named Tim. Tim was very strange, and always had a creepy vibe about him. I always wondered if perhaps he either dabbled in things of a dark nature, or if he just had something unusually sinister inside of him. Either way, his house always had an odd feel, even when he wasn't there. So, we were laying in bed one night. Jake was already dozing lightly, and I was just laying there waiting to drift off to sleep myself. I thought at first that my mind and eyes were playing tricks on me, when I saw what I can only describe as a darker-than-black, smoky mass forming directly above us on the ceiling. I was confused because the room was pitch black, yet I could still see this mass materializing before my very eyes, very clearly. At first I didn't feel anything and wasn't sure what to think, but that quickly changed as I realized I was being gripped by a paralyzing fear and knew this shadow form was watching me and contemplating doing harm. I was wide-eyed, laying stark still, feeling weighed down, and holding my breath. I had the feeling that if I moved too quickly, the shadow mass would pounce on me like a wild animal, and all the life and air would go out of me completely. I was trying to nudge Jake awake without moving too much, and after what seemed like an eternity, he finally roused and asked, What? What's going on? He sounded rather ticked off that I woke him up. In barely an audible whisper, I asked, What is on the ceiling? At first, he neither saw or said anything, but when he finally did, all that came out was a long, drown-out, um... We both just laid there, staring at this thing floating above us for at least a minute. I was scared to move, but I knew I would come to harm if I didn't. I then grabbed my cell phone off the nightstand and turned the screen on. The mass then moved into the corner of the wall and ceiling, at which point Jake and I jumped up, grabbed shoes and coats, and bolted out of the room. I tried to call my friend Leah, who is a psychic medium and light worker, to ask what I should do, and even though the call connected, all you could hear was crazy static, and the only thing I kept vaguely hearing from her was to get out of the house. We ended up heading to her house to get away, and never encountered that particular entity again. My second encounter at this house was outside. Jake and I were sitting on the front steps enjoying the warm night when this shadow person appeared in the street in front of us. It was walking up the street a little way, and then just disappeared. I remember it looking like a teenage kid wearing a black hoodie. We both felt like it was something keeping watch, but it did not have the bad intentions of the first shadow that we had encountered. My third and by far saddest experience in this house, I will not forget as long as I live. I have to mention this involves my cousin, not technically related, as her uncle is married to my aunt, but we became fast friends as we lived very close to each other and hung out together frequently. Jake and I were in bed and had been asleep for a few hours when I was awakened by the feeling of someone or something in the room with us. I did not feel any fear, which seemed unusual to me at the time, although I was a bit apprehensive to open my eyes to see what the presence was. When I did finally open my eyes, my attention was immediately drawn to the closet. It was an open closet, having no doors or curtains, and Jake did not have anything hanging in there, as he is kind of a minimalist. I only mention this as I have woken up in the middle of the night and seen things on chairs and mistaken them for entities and then laughed at myself. But this was not the case this time. I stared into the closet to make sure I was actually seeing what my eyes were telling me. There stood a shadowy but well-formed Grim Reaper sort of figure. My rational brain was telling me I should be scared, but my intuition was telling me to not be, so I wasn't. I remember thinking to myself, in a matter-of-fact way, uh, there's a grim reaper in the closet. I didn't think anything else of it, and then drifted back to sleep. I woke up the next morning, not really thinking about it much, until my phone rang. It was my aunt, calling me to tell me that my cousin had committed suicide the night before. She had hung herself in a closet. Needless to say, I was absolutely floored and rendered completely speechless. 
I now know it was death in the closet that had come to tell me about my cousin. I am sorry for the length of this. I wanted to share the three somewhat similar experiences I had in the same house. I honestly feel as though there was something about that house, or even possibly something the owner was doing, that made it easier for all these shadow figures to come through. I have had loads of other experiences and will write more when I have time. Thank you for reading, and thank you for your podcast. I feel like being able to hear other people's stories, and also be able to tell my own, is a good way to cope with some of the strange things that have happened to all of us. Especially when the people directly around you tend to not believe you. Lisa As we come to the end of tonight's episode, I'd like to say thank you to all of you for tuning in, and a special thank you goes out to Ruth, Ash, Jenny, and Lisa for sharing their experiences. If you'd like to share your thoughts or a similar experience with one of tonight's storytellers, please email me and I'll be sure to forward your message onto them. If you've witnessed something that you can't explain and would like to have your story shared on the podcast, please contact me at paranormalmysteriespodcast at gmail.com or visit paranormalmysteriespodcast.com and click on the Tell Your Story link. All of our contact information can be found in the show notes. Until next time... I hope you all have a safe and healthy beginning to your week, and we'll see you back here on Wednesday with our next episode. From all of us at Paranormal Mysteries, thank you for listening, and please remember, don't wait for the unknown to come to you. Get out there and find it.